Hi everyone, I'm Ashley at the Silver Bay Public Library and I am back once again with a read aloud for you guys. As you may remember, last time we finished our story floors and it had a pretty wacky ending, um, I will say so myself. But it was part of a trilogy and I thought about continuing the trilogy and just reading the trilogy, getting book two for this time. But I want to encourage you guys to come to the library and actually check out the other books and read them for yourselves. So that book was Floors by Patrick Carmen. So if you want to come read the book, come into the library, let us know, have your parents give us a call, whatever it may be. But that means for this time we have another book, another author, and another wonderful story to come and explore. Another adventure that awaits us. This book is called A Single Shard by Linda Sue Park. And if you see here this uh, golden circle, it's a Newbery Medal because this is an award winning book in children's, young adult, juvenile literature. And I think it's going to be quite an interesting read. So we're going to jump right in um, and begin the adventure. This is going to be quite a bit different than our previous book, but please try to stay with me. I'm sure it has a wonderful message and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So, a small village on the west coast of Korea, mid to late 12th century. So the 1100s. So we're in the 21st century, the year 2020. That means this would have taken place back about 900 years ago, theoretically. So let's begin with chapter one. Eh, tree ear. Have you hungered well today? Crane Man called out as Tree Ear drew near the bridge. The well-fed of the village greeted each other politely by saying, Have you eaten well today? Tree Ear and his friend turned the greeting inside out for their own little joke. Tree Ear squeezed the bulging pouch that he wore at his waist. He had meant to hold back the good news, but the excitement spilled out of him. Crane Man, a good thing that you greeted me so just now, for later today we will have to use the proper words. He held the bag high. Tree Ear was delighted when Crane Man's eyes widened in surprise. He knew that Crane Man would guess at once. Only one thing could give a bag that kind of smooth fullness. Not carrot tops or chicken bones, which protruded in odd lumps. No, the bag was filled with rice. Crane Man raised his walking crutch in a salute. Come, my young friend, tell me how you came by such a fortune. A tale worth hearing, no doubt. Tree Ear had been trotting along the road on his early morning perusal of the village rubbish sheeps. Ahead of him, a man carried a heavy load of jigay, an open-framed backpack made of branches. On the jigay was a large woven straw container, the kind commonly used to carry rice. Tree Ear knew that the rice must be from last year's crop. In the fields surrounding the village, this season's rice had only just begun to grow. It would be many months before the rice was harvested and the poor allowed to glean the fallen grain from the bare fields. Only then would they taste the pure flavor of rice and feel its solid goodness in their bellies. Just looking at the straw box made water rush into Tree Ear's mouth. The man had paused in the road and hoisted the wooden jigay higher on his back, shifting the cumbersome weight. As Tree Ear stared, rice began to trickle out of a hole in the straw box. The trickle thickened and became a stream. Obviously, or oblivious, the man continued on his way. For a few short moments, Tree Ear's thoughts wrestled with one another. Tell him quickly before he loses too much rice. No, don't say anything. You'll be able to pick up the fallen rice when he rounds the bend. Tree Ear made his decision. He waited until the man had reached the bend in the road, then ran to catch him. Honorable sir, Tree Ear said, panting and bowing. As I walked behind you, I noticed that you are marking your path with rice. The farmer turned and saw the trail of rice. A well-built man with a broad suntan face. He pushed his straw hat back. Scratched his head and laughed ruefully. Impatience, said the farmer. I should have had this container woven with a double wall, but it would have taken more time. Now I pay for not waiting a bit longer. He struggled out of the jigay's straps and inspected the container. He prodded the straw to close the gap, but to no avail, so he threw his arms up in mock despair. Tree ear grinned. He liked the farmer's easygoing nature. Fetch me a few leaves, boy, said the farmer. Tree Ear complied, and the man stuffed them into the container as a temporary patch. The farmer squatted to don the jigay. As he started walking, he called over his shoulder. 
Good deserves good, urchin. The rice on the ground is yours if you can be troubled to gather it. Many kind, many thanks, kind sir, tree ear bowed, very pleased with himself. He had made a lucky guess and his waste pouch would soon be filled with rice. Tree ear had learned from Crane Man's example. Foraging in the woods and rubbish heaps, gathering fallen grain heads in the autumn. These were honorable ways to garner a meal, requiring time and work. But stealing and begging, Crane Man said, made a man no better than a dog. Work, work, man, work, work gives a man dignity. Stealing takes it away, he often said. Following Crane Man's advice was not always easy for Tree Ear. Today, for example, was it stealing to wait as Tree Ear had for more rice to fall before alerting the man that his rice bag was leaking? Did a good deed balance a bad one? Tree Ear often pondered these kinds of questions alone or in discussion with Crane Man. Such questions serve in two ways, Crane Man had explained. They keep a man's mind sharp and his thoughts off his empty stomach. Now, as always, he seemed to know Tree Ear's thoughts without hearing them spoken. Tell me about this farmer, he said. What kind of man was he? Tree Ear considered the question for several moments, stirring his memory at last, he answered. One, one who likes patience. He said it himself. He had not wanted to wait for a sturdier container to be built, and he could not be bothered to pick up the fallen rice. Tree Ear paused. But he laughed easily, even at himself. If he was here now and heard you tell of waiting a little longer before speaking, what do you think he would say or do? He would laugh. Trier said, surprising himself at the speed of his response. Then more slowly, I think he would not have minded. Crane Man nodded, satisfied, and Trier thought of something his friend often said. Scholars read the great words of the world, but you and I must learn to read the world itself. Trier was so called after the mushroom that grew in wrinkled half circles on dead or fallen tree trunks, emerging from the rotten wood without benefit or parent seed. A good name for an orphan, Crane Man said. If ever Tree Ear had had another name, he no longer remembered it, nor the family that might have named him so. Tree Ear shared the space under the bridge with Crane Man, or rather Crane Man shared it with him. After all, Crane Man had been there first and would not be leaving any time soon. The shriveled and twisted calf and foot he had been born with made sure of that. Tree Man knew the story of his friend's name. When they saw my leg at birth, it was though I would not survive, Crane Man had said. Then, as I went through life on one leg, it was said I was like a crane. But beside standing on one leg, cranes are also a symbol of long life. True enough, Crane Man added. He had outlived all of his family, and unable to work, had been forced to sell his possessions one by one, including, at last, the roof over his head. Thus it was that he had come to live under the bridge. Once a year or so earlier... Once, a year or so earlier, Tree Ear had asked him how long he had lived there. Crane Man shook his head. He no longer remembered. But then he brightened and hobbled over to one side of the bridge, beckoning Tree Ear to join him. I do not remember how long I have been here, he said, but I do know how long you have. And he pointed upward to the underside of the bridge. I wonder what I... I wonder that I have not shown you this before. On one of the slats was a series of deep scratches, as if made with a pointed stone. Tree Ear examined them, then shook his head at Crane Man. So... One mark for each spring since you came here, Crane Man explained. I kept count of your years, for I thought the time would come when you would like to know how old you are. Tree Ear looked again, this time with keen interest. There was a mark for each finger of both hands. Ten marks in all. Crane Man answered before Tree Ear asked. No, you have more than ten years, he said. When you first came and I began making those marks, you were in perhaps your second year, already on two legs and able to talk. Tree Ear nodded, and he knew the rest of the story already. Crane Man had learned but little from the man who had brought Tree Ear to the bridge. The man had been paid by a kindly monk in the city of Songdo to bring Tree Ear to the little seaside village of Chulopo. Chulo. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Sorry. Tree Ear's parents had died of fever, and the monk knew of an uncle in Chulopo. When the travelers arrived, the man discovered that the uncle no longer lived there. The house had been abandoned long before. He took Tree Ear to the temple on the mountainside, but the monks had been unable to take the boy in because fever raged there as well. The villagers told the man to take the child to the bridge, where Crane Man would care for him until the temple was free of sickness. And, Crane Man always said, when a monk comes to fetch you a few months later, you would not, when a monk came to fetch you a few months later, you would not leave. You clung to my good leg like a monkey to a tree, not crying, but not letting go either. The monk went away, you stayed. When Tree Ear was younger, he had asked for the story often, as if hearing it over and over again might reveal something more, what his father's trade had been, what his mother had looked like, where his uncle had gone. 
But there was never anything more. It no longer mattered. If there was more to having a home than Crane Man and the bridge, Trier had neither knowledge nor need of it. Breakfast that morning was a feast, a bit of the rice boiled to a gruel in a cast-off earthenware pot, served up in a bowl carved from a gourd. And Crane Man produced yet another surprise to add to the meal. Two chicken-leg bones. No flesh remained on the arid bones, but the two friends cracked them open and worried away every scrap of marrow from inside. Afterward, Tree Ear washed in the river and fetched a gourd of water for Crane Man, who never went into the river if he could help it. He hated getting his feet wet. Then Tree Ear set about tidying up the area under the bridge. He took care to keep the place neat, for he disliked having to clear a space to sleep at the tired end of the day. Housekeeping complete, Tree Ear left his companion and set off back up the road. This time he did not zigzag between rubbish heaps, but strode purposely toward a small house set apart from the others at a curve in the road. Tree Ear slowed as he neared the mud and wood structure. He tilted his head, listening, and grinned when the droning syllables of a song chant reached his ear. The Master Potter Min was singing, which meant that it was a throwing day. Min's house backed onto the beginnings of the foothills and their brushy growth, which gave way to pine wooded mountains beyond. Tree Ear swung wide of the house. Under the deep eaves at the back, Min kept his potter's wheel. He was there now, his gray head bent over the wheel, chanting his wordless song. Tree Ear made his way cautiously to his favorite spot, behind a palominia tree, whose low branches kept him hidden from view. He peeped through the leaves and caught his breath in delight. Min was just beginning a new pot. Min threw a massive clay the size of a cabbage onto the center of the wheel. He picked it up and threw it again, threw it several times. After one last throw, he sat down and stared at the clay for a moment. Using his foot to spin the base of the wheel, he placed dampened hands on the sluggardly lump. And for the hundredth time, Tree Ear watched the miracle. In only a few moments, the clay rose and fell, grew taller, then rounded down, until it curved into perfect symmetry. The spinning slowed. The chant, too, died out and became a mutter of words that Tree Ear could not hear. Min sat straight up. He crossed his arms and leaned back a little, as if to see the vase from a distance. Turning the wheel slowly with his knee, he inspected the graceful shape for invisible faults, then pa. He shook his head and in a single motion of disgust, scooped up the clay and slapped it back on the wheel, whereupon it collapsed into an oafish lump again, as if ashamed. Tree Ear opened his mouth to let out his breath silently, only then realizing that he had been keeping it back. To his eyes, the vase had been perfect. It's with half its height, it's curved like those of a flower petal. When he wondered, had Min... Why, he wondered, had Min found it unworthy? What had he seen that so displeased him? Min never failed to reject his first attempt. Then he would repeat the whole process. This day, Tree Ear was able to watch the clay rise and fall four times before Min was satisfied. Each of the four efforts had looked identical to Tree Ear, but something about the fourth pleased Min. He took a length of twine and slipped it deftly under the vase to release it from the wheel, then placed the vase carefully on a tray to dry. As Tree Ear crept away, he counted the days on his fingers. He knew the potter's routine well. It would be many days before another throwing day. The village of Chulpo faced the sea. It's back to the mountains and the river edging it like a neat stream. Its potters produced the delicate celadon ware that had achieved fame not only in Korea, but as far away as the court of the Chinese emperor. Chulpo had become an important village for ceramics by virtue of both its location and its soil. On the shore of the western sea, it had access both to the easiest sea route northward and to plentiful trade with China, and the clay from the village pits contained exactly the right amount of iron to produce the exquisite gray-green color of Celadon so prized by collectors. Tree Ear knew every potter in the village, but until recently he had known them only for their rubbish heaps. It was hard for him to believe that he had never taken the time to watch them at work before. In recent years, the pottery from the village kilns had gained great favor among those wealthy enough to buy pieces as gifts for both the royal court and the Buddhist temples and the potters had achieved new levels of prosperity. The pickings from the rubbish heaps had become richer in consequence, and for the first time, Tree Ear was able to forget about his stomach for a few hours each day. During those hours, it was Min he chose to watch most closely. The other potters kept their wheels in small windowless shacks, but in the warm months, Min preferred to work beneath the eaves behind his house, open to the breeze and the view of the mountains. Working without walls meant that Min possessed great skill and the confidence to match it. Potters guarded their secrets jealously. 
a new shape for a teapot, a new inscribed design. These were things that the potters refused to reveal until a piece was ready to show to a buyer. Min did not seem to care about such secrecy. It was as if he were saying, Go ahead, watch me. No matter, you will not be able to imitate my skill. It was true, and it was also the main reason that Trier loved watching Min. His work was the finest in the region, perhaps even in the whole country. And that was chapter one. We are going to go on and read chapter two because that was a pretty short chapter. So let us continue. Tree ear peered between the leaves of the Pal Polonia tree, puzzled. Several days had passed since his last visit to Min's house, and he had calculated that it was time for another throwing day. But there was no sign of Min at his work, nor any wet clay on the wheel. The workshop area was tidy, with a few chickens in the yard, the only sign of life. Emboldened by the silence, Tree Ear emerged from his hiding place and approached the house. Against the wall was a set of shelves holding a few of Min's latest creations. They were at the stage the potters called Leather Hard. Dried by the air, but not yet glazed or fired. Unglazed, the work was of little interest to thieves. The finished pieces were surely locked up somewhere in the house. Tree Ear paused at the edge of the brush and listened hard one last time. A hen clucked proudly and Tree Ear grinned. Min would have an egg for his supper. But there was still no sign of the potter, so Trier tiptoed the last few steps to stand between the shelves. For the first time, he was seeing Min's work at close range. There was a duck that would have fit in the palm of his hand, with a tiny hole in his bill. Trier had seen such a duck in use before. A painter had been sitting on the river bank working on a water scene. The painter had poured water from the duck's bill onto a stone, a single drop at a time, mixing ink to exactly the correct consistency for his work. Tree ear stared at Min's duck, though it was now a dull gray, so detailed were its features that he found himself half listening for the sound of a quack. Min had shaped and then carved the clay to form curve of wing and tilt of head. Even the little tail curled up with an impudence that made Tree ear smile. He tore his gaze away from the duck to examine the next piece, a tall jug with ribbed lines that imitated the shape of a melon. The lines were perfectly symmetrical, curving so gracefully from top to bottom that Tree Ear longed to run his fingers along the smooth, shallow grooves. The melon's stem and leaves were cleverly shaped to form the lid of the jug. The last piece of the, on the shelf was the least interesting, a rectangular lidded box as large as his two hands. It was completely undecorated. Disappointed in its plainness, Tree Ear was ready to turn away when, he th when a thought struck him. Outside the box was plain, but perhaps inside? Holding his breath, he reached out, gently lifting the lid, and looked inside. He grinned in double delight as his own correct guess and at Min's skill. The plain box held five smaller boxes, a small round one in the center, and four curved boxes that fit around it perfectly. The small boxes appeared to completely fill the large container, but Min had left exactly the right amount of space to allow any of them to be lifted out. Trier put the lid of the large box down on the shelf and picked up one of the curved containers. On the underside of it, Slid was a lip of clay that held the lid in place. Tree Ear's eyes flicked back and forth between the small pieces in his hands and the large container. His brow furrowed in thought. How did Min fit them together so perfectly? Perhaps he made the large box, then a second one to fit inside, and cut the smaller boxes from that? Or did he make an inside box first and fit the larger box around it? Maybe he began with the small central box and the curved ones, and someone shouted. The chickens squawked noisily, and Tree Ear dropped what he was holding. He stood there paralyzed for a moment, then threw his hands up in front of his face to protect himself from the blows that were raining down on his head and shoulders. It was the old potter. Thief! He screamed. How dare you come here? How dare you touch my work? Tree Ear did the only thing he could think of. He dropped to his knees and cowered in a deep, formal bow. Please, please, honorable sir, I am not stealing your work. I only came to admire it. Min's cane halted in mid-blow. The potter stood over the boy with the cane still poised for another strike. Have you been here before, beggar boy? Tree's, tree Ear's thoughts scrambled about as he tried to think what to answer. The truth seemed easiest. Yes, honorable sir, I come often to watch your work. Ah! Tree Ear was still doubled over in his bow, but out of the corner of his eye he could see the tip of the cane as it was lowered to the ground. He allowed himself a single sigh of relief. So it is you who breaks the twigs and bruises the leaves of the Palomina tree just beyond. Tree Ear nodded, feeling his face flush. He had thought he was covering his tracks well. Not to steal, you say. How do I know you do not watch just to see where, when I have made something of extra value? That tree ear raised his head and looked at Min. He kept his voice respectful, but his words were proud. I would not steal. Stealing and begging makes a man no better than a dog. 
The potter stared at the boy for a long moment. At last, Min seemed to make up his mind about something, and when he spoke, his voice had lost the sharpest edge of its anger. So you were not stealing. It is the same thing to me. With one part damaged, the rest is of no use. He gestured at the misshapen pottery box on the ground, badly dented from its fall. Get on your way, then. I know better than to ask for payment for what you have ruined. Trier stood slowly, shame hot in his breast. It was true. He could never hope to pay Min for the damaged box. Min picked it up and tossed it on the rubbish heap at the side of the yard. He continued to mutter crossly. I three days' work, and for what? For nothing I'm behind now. This order will be late. Tree Ear had taken dragging steps out of the yard, but on hearing the old potter's mutterings, he lifted his head and turned back toward him. Honorable potter, sir, could I not work for you as payment? Perhaps my help could save you some time? Min shook his head impatiently. What could you do, an untrained child? I have no time to teach you. You would be more trouble than help. Tree Ear stepped forward eagerly. You would not need to teach so much as you think, sir. I have been watching you for many months now. I know how you mix the clay and turn the wheel. I have watched you make many things. The potter waved one hand to cut off the boy's words and spoke with derision. Turn the wheel, ha! He thinks he can sit and make a pot just like that. Tree Ear crossed his arms stubbornly and did not look away. Min picked up the rest of the box then and tossed it too on the rubbish heap. He muttered under his breath so Tree Ear could not hear the words. Min straightened up and glanced around, first at his shelf, then at the wheel, and finally at Tree Ear. <laughs> yes, all right, he said, his voice still rough with annoyance. Come tomorrow at daybreak, then. Three days it took me to make that box, so you will give me nine days' work in return. I cannot even begin to think how much greater the value of my work is than yours, but we will settle on this for a start. Tree Ear bowed in agreement. He walked around the side of the house, then flew off down the road. He could hardly wait to tell Crane Man, for the first time in his life, he would have real work to do. Upon arriving the next day for work, Tree Ear learned it was Min's turn to chop wood for the kiln fires. That was why he had not been at home the day before. Like most of the potter's vil villages, Chuolpo had a communal kin, set on the hillside just outside the center of the village. It looked like a long, low tunnel made of hardened clay. The potters took turns using the kiln and keeping up the supply of fuel. Min handed Tree Ear a small axe and led him around the side of the house to a wheeled cart. Fill the cart with wood, Min barked. Dry wood, not wet. Do not come back until the cart is full. Tree Ear felt as though the sun had suddenly dimmed. The night before, sleep had not come easily. He had imagined himself at the wheel, a beautiful pot growing from the clay before him. Perhaps, he thought now, if he had chopped enough wood quickly, there would still be time at the end of the day. Min quashed that hope with his next words. Take care to go well into the mountains, he said. Far too many trees have been cut too close to the village. You will walk a long way before you find a plentiful stand of trees. Tree Ear swallowed a sigh as he placed the axe in the cart. Grasping the two handles, he wheeled the cart onto the road. He turned to wave farewell, but the potter was no longer there. The sound of the throwing song floated out from behind the house. Chopping woods for hours without a single bite to eat had been hard enough, but the worst of that day was the long trip back down the mountainside with the cart full of wood. The path was rutted and bumpy. The homemade cart was poorly balanced, awkward with its heavy load. At every step, Trier had to keep his eyes trained on the path and the cart. In spite of his efforts, whenever the wheels hit a deep rut, the cart tipped precariously and some of the logs spilled out. Then he had to stop, pick up the fallen wood. He was more than annoying because he had been careful to lay the wood neatly as he chopped, and each bump led to further disarray of the tidy pile. After this had happened more times than he could count, Tree Ear neared the end of the mountain path. Soon it would widen and smooth out into the more heav heavily traveled foothills road. Tree Ear lifted his head for a moment in eager anticipation of the end of his journey. Just then, the right-hand wheel caught a stone. The cart handles were wrenched from his hand, and the cart tipped onto its side. The momentum pulled Tree Ear off balance, and he tipped over the cart and tumbled headfirst to the ground. He sat up, dazed. For a moment, he didn't know whether to curse or cry. He set his lips together tightly and scrambled to his feet, then pulled the cart upright and began flinging the wood back in, into it in a frenzy. As he heaved a large, round log, an arrow of pain shot through his right hand. He cried out and clenched it into a fist for a moment and, until the throbbing eased a little. Then he opened it cautiously and examined the injury. The pillow of fluid that had formed on his palm during the long hours of wielding the axe had burst. Blood ran from the wound, mixing with dirt and small bits of bark. Trier stared at it and he could not stop the tears that pressed hot between his, behind his eyes. Angrily, he blinked away the tears and set about tearing a strip of cloth from the bottom of his tunic. There was no water nearby, so he spat on his palm and wiped it as best as he could, clenching his teeth against the pain. He used his other hand and his teeth to wrap the cloth and tie the cloth into a makeshift bandage. 
From then on, he worked slowly and methodically, stacking the wood in neat rows in the cart. The sun was low in the sky when he finished at last, and wheeled the cart cautiously down the path to the foothills road. T tree ear dragged himself home to the bridge that evening. Crane Man's normally placid expression was replaced with a frown of worry when Tree Ear stumbled into the space under the struts and collapsed in a heap on the ground. Crane Man said nothing. He merely held out a bowl in which he had placed a small mound of rice and a little pile of boiled greens. Too exhausted to eat, Tree Ear waved the food away, but Crane Man hobbled to his side and used his crutch for support as he eased himself down to sit next to Tree Ear. Crane Man picked up a little rice in his fingers and insistently, but still without a word, began feeding Tree Ear as if he was a baby. Tree Ear did not remember finishing the meal, but he awoke the next morning to see Crane Man swinging himself down under the bridge by holding one of the struts, as he always did. Small and slight, and who knew how old, Crane Man still moved his upper body with the ease of a young man. Many were the times that Tree Ear forgot completely about the useless leg. Where had Crane Man been so early? Tree Ear sat up stiffly and began to rub his eyes as he brought his right hand up to his face. He caught sight of the crude bandage. It was stiff with dried blood. Yes, that is what I have been about, said Crane Man. Now let us see what we can see. Tree Ear held out his hand. Crane Man untied the bandage and began to unwrap it. <sighs> Tree Ear hissed sharply in pain and snatched his hand away. The final layer of cloth clung stubbornly to the wound and Crane Man had been trying to pull it off. Come now, my monkey friend, said Crane Man kindly but firmly. It must be removed so we can clean the wound. The demons of sickness are no doubt already scheming to enter your body through such a door. Tree Ear rose and shuffled to the water's edge. He crouched and dipped his hand in the water. Its coolness soothed the throb, and its wetness loosened the cloth's grip on the wound. Wincing, he eased the bandage away. While Tree Ear cleaned the wound, Crane Man took the strip of cloth and washed it thoroughly with water from the gourd bowl, scrubbing it against the flat stone at the river's edge. Then he wrung it out and handed it to Tree Ear, who scrambled up the bank and hung it on the strut to dry in the sun. From his waist pouch, Crane Man took a handful of green herbs he had gathered in the woods earlier that morning. He ground them to a paste between two stones, then scooped up some of the paste with two fingers and applied it to Tree Ear's hand. Close your hand, Crane Man ordered. Squeeze so the healing juices may enter the wound. The two friends ate the last of the rice treasure for breakfast, Tree Ear holding the paste as he ate with his other hand. Then Crane Man tied the now dry strip of cloth back into a bandage. There, he said. A few days rest, we'll see that hand good as new. He looked at Tree Ear sternly. Tree Ear said nothing. He knew that Crane Man had already guessed there would be no rest that day. There were still eight days of work to be done for men. And that is where we're going to leave the book for this time. Please make sure to come back again next time to hear about the adventures of Tree Ear, Crane Man, and the Potter Men. Because I'm sure there are many things yet to come. Thank you for listening. Make sure to check us. Well... Come back and listen Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for listening. Yet again, make sure to stop at the library and have a wonderful